Long now has mankind looked up to the skies and wondered if we are alone in this universe. Many miraculous things have been spotted all over the world, reported by our militaries, and sparked great debates amongst ourselves. I am here to tell you that ladies and gentlemen, people of Earth, brothers and sisters of all races, all countries, that we are not alone. We have never been alone. That some higher power has seeked to spread the gift of life throughout the universe and beyond all comprehension. It is in these times we must learn to love one another. We must not share hate, but joy. We must not inhibit, but we must grow. These beings are our friends. They are our family. They want to help us become better, to see the true potential of mankind. And for maybe one day, we will join them in their voyage to help other beings from other star systems. As shocking as this news may be, it is nothing new. Our governments of the world have known for quite some time that we are not alone in this universe, and we have had contact for many of years, slowly preparing the American public and the publics of the world for such a revelation. We are not alone, and we are about to embark on the greatest journey mankind has ever experienced. Ladies and gentlemen, we have contact. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Contact. Today, we have a very special guest recommended by our dear friend Philip Mantle, Kevin Randall, who has a new book coming out. It's called Levelant. It's going to examine a U- series of UFO sightings in the area. This man has probably some of the best qualifications you would expect for the UFO field, so I'm very excited for this interview. So, Kevin, how are you, man? I'm doing fine, and you? Oh, we're doing all right. Yep, Surprise, yep. for co-host here, let me talk. Yes, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's UFO night, it's your night, Dakota, you know. I would just like to show everybody in the chat the book. Please go and purchase this, you know. There you go. Just so we'll, we'll give you links to the book and the location where you can find this book after the show. Thank you. There you go. It's indeed. Yep. So... Oh, no, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, I just welcome Ke- uh, Kevin to the show. I was just going to ask you, how did how did you get into this kind of era? How did you get into this subject? You mean UFOs, I take it? Yes, yes. Ooh. I always blame my mother. She was a fan of science fiction. Science fiction deals with alien visitations, interstellar flight, alien civilizations. And when I was a kid, and I hesitate to say this because it dates me, but everybody can see I have gray hair, white hair. She took me to the movie Earth vs. the Flying Saucers. And that sort of sparked my interest. And I think I probably did one of my first UFO investigations when I was still in high school. A friend of mine's mother had seen a UFO. And in the 1960s, the idea was that uh, they're just blobs of light in the distance. They're not very distinct. They're uh, yes. blurry things and I wanted to talk to her about it she'd said she'd seen the object about 200 feet over the barn on their farm in South Dakota I believe it was and my one question I wanted answered was did it have sharp edges was it distinct and she said oh yeah, yeah it was very clear very obvious what it was it was not a conventional aircraft it wasn't a blob of light it was a well defined craft And that, of course, sort of reinforced my interest. And then from that point on, I've always been interested in the topic, Uh, did a lot of reading on it and done a lot of investigations uh, into it. During my military service, for example, whenever I was in a specific location for any period of time, if I had free time, I would go to the local newspaper morgues and look up UFO sightings from the past in, in their uh, files and talk to people in the area who might have seen something. So I've often had this interest in UFOs and uh, yeah. sort of 
used it to springboard into a writing career as well. For my first magazine articles, first articles I had published were UFO articles. Later on, I did science fiction and action adventure and have done a number of UFO books, but that whole, that's the way I got involved in this whole thing. It's a fascinating subject. It really is. So I'll hand you over to my host, Dakota. Fire away, my friend. All right. Oh, there's so much here. So, now obviously, you know, don't feel bad about dating yourself. There's a reason why my friend and I here are bald. But, <laughs> <laughs> so this book, Level One, uh, Philip managed to send us a bit of details about it, but I obviously do not want to spoil too much. So, can you tell us about more about the incident you wrote about in this book? Well, Leveland is a small city, small town just west of Lubbock, Texas, which I think if you look at your map, you can find Lubbock. And mm -hmm. Leveland is about 15 minutes away. And during the evening of November 2nd, 1957, a number of people, a large number of people, were uh, saw a UFO close at hand, came close to their car, stalled the car engines, put out the headlights, that sort of thing, people all around the area. Uh, the first sighting took place around 3 o'clock in the morning of uh, November 2nd in a place called Canadian, Texas, where the um, witnesses saw a landed craft, and there was witnesses on both sides of the craft and uh, had similar problems. The Air Force file on that blocked out the name of the civilian witness, but we have the name of the, the military witness who was involved in that. Later on, about 10.30 that night, uh, a fellow named Pedro Sacido, <clears throat> who was labeled as a farmhand, as a barber, a kind of a all-around guy, a veteran of the Korean War, was driving toward Level Land with a friend, um, Jose Salazar, and the car stopped. The engine, the, the, the pickup truck they were driving stopped, and they saw a blue glowing object come down close to the coastal road land. Saucedo was so scared, he dived out of the car and rolled underneath the engine, or rolled underneath the vehicle to protect himself. And Jose sat there just kind of paralyzed. Later on, the object turned a bright red, bright orange and took off in the distance. And once it was gone, Saucedo was able to start his car. But they were so afraid of, they would encounter it again. They didn't go to Level Land. They called the sheriff. And, of course, the reaction mm -hmm. was, these guys are drunk. They're playing some kind of a joke. They just <laughs> blew it off. Mm -hmm. yeah. But not long after that, they got another call, and then another, and then another, and they realized something was going on out there. The people were calling and saying that you know, this object, this glowing red object, came close to their car, uh, stalled the engine, put out the headlights, filled the radio with static, and once it was gone, they were able to restart the cars and uh, continue on their way. The Air Force claimed that there was only three people who saw the object. If you go through the Air Force file on it, you can find the names of at least nine people who saw the object. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, five that saw the object. NICAP, which was a civilian organization, said there were nine people. I found the names of at least people at 13 separate locations. They all independently reporting this thing. Now, the important thing is, after it became clear something was going on, the sheriff, and I, I hate his name, it's Weir Clem, and I wish there was something like Jack Armstrong or something, <laughs> something not quite that strange, but... Um, he decided it was time for him to go out to look for it uh, because there were so many of these reports coming in. He was in his patrol car with a uh, another uh, deputy sheriff. Behind him was a car with state police in it. I think it's the uh, Texas Department of Public Safety. That's what it is now. I think that's what it was called in 1957. And importantly, there was a third car in this mini convoy filled with Air Force officers. And they're out driving down the road where Saucedo had seen the, the object and a number of other people reported along this highway up just north of, of Level Land. And according to the Air Force file, all they saw was a streak of light in the distance. But it turns out that if you find uh, some of the documentation from newspaper reporters earlier on, before the Air Force arrived to investigate, uh, the sheriff is reported as saying, I saw a glowing red object, bright red object, the next day, which would be November 3rd, the sheriff took his car into the mechanics to see if there was something wrong with it. The only reason I can think he would have done that is his car was stalled. They got close enough for yeah. the cars to stall. And so now we have the sheriff in a car. He sees the object, not a streak of light in the distance, as the Air Force reported and has been reported repeatedly in UFO books, 
the sheriff got close enough to see an object. A fellow named Don Berliner did an interview with the sheriff in the mid-1970s. And again, the sheriff talked about seeing this glowing object. Mm-hmm. Another fellow, Don Berlinson, and yeah, there's a lot of Dons in this story. Don Berlinson, who lives in Roswell, which, is, by the way, is not all that far from Level Land, uh, interviewed mm-hmm. the sheriff's widow and his daughter around uh, 2000. And they said that the the sheriff saw the object as well, saw something strange. So we've got that information that's coming out now. The Air Force managed to suppress it back in 1957. But the important point is the sheriff went out, he saw the object, it stalled his car, and there were Air Force officers involved in that observation, in that um, event. The, The question becomes, where's their testimony? There was an Air Force investigation that took place on on Tuesday, which would have been the 5th of November, if I remember correctly. Uh, Staff Sergeant from Air Force Base came down. He was part of the uh, 1006th Air Intelligence Service Squadron, which was obviously an intelligence organization. He spent seven hours in level land talking to people. He talked to six people. And then he blew out of town. There's no indication in the Air Force file he ever talked to any of the Air Force officers involved. The other thing we get from newspaper clippings and other information is the provost marshal, which is the chief of police on the Air Force base, the uh, top top, uh, law enforcement officer on the base, accompanied the sheriff the next day looking for landing traces where these things supposedly landed, looking for traces. There's no indication they ever interviewed that man either. Now, according to Burlinson, he talked to a uh, rancher, just north of, of Level Land, and the 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 widow the widow I'm sorry the widow of the the rancher and the daughter said there was a circular burned area on their their ranch. Mm-hmm. He couldn't talk to the the rancher because he had passed away, but the daughter was still alive, and he talked to her. So now we have information of a landing trace as well with independent corroboration. So we know that a we had an event in in Level Land that took place over a period of about two and a half hours. People at independent locations are calling the sheriff, calling the local police, saying this UFO, this object, this glowing egg-shaped object came down close to the car, stalled the engine. One guy said he he watched it for five minutes. Another guy said he watched it for 15. So they got a good look at it. So we have an object that's interacting with the environment. We have observations by law enforcement. And then we have landing traces. Now, if the proper investigation had been conducted in 1957, you and I would be having mm-hmm. a different conversation. Yeah. We really. would have gathered at least three different uh, types of, of evidence, the, the landing traces, the interaction with the uh, environment, and the testimony of the witnesses. But instead, the conversation devolved into an argument about how many witnesses there were. And the Air Force was able to divert the conversation from what the witnesses had seen and what they had, what had happened yeah. to them to how many witnesses there actually were to an object. And one of the people that they said only saw a streak of light in the distance actually reported in before the Air Force arrived to investigate and long after it that he had actually seen the object and his card stalled as well. That is fascinating. Wow. That is it it makes you wonder it makes you wonder if whoever they were that came was looking for something, maybe they were looking for the crash site at Roswell. I don't think it has anything to do with Roswell. No. I, what, I, what, I, what I see in this is these ideas of these electromagnetic effects, is what we call them stalling the car engines, yeah. electromagnetic effect. And, and, and there was a study done by a guy named Eric Herr and I think Fran Ridge, where they collected uh, cases of close approaches of UFOs causing compasses to fail, compasses to spin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. which indicates magnetism, of course, and there were some other things that indicate the magnetism as well. So we we have that sort of thing all put together. Uh, but these sorts of sightings with the electromagnetic effects are rare. They're, they're not as yeah. nearly as common as the normal UFO sighting. Even close approaches of UFOs don't always result in the um, – uh, stalling of a car engine, but yeah. there's other aspects of it as well. Mark Rodiker, from which is the director, scientific director, I should say, of the Center for UFO Studies, put together a, yeah. a monograph in 1985, and he had over 400 reports of vehicle interference, just vehicle interference, starting in 1909 in England, where a guy was riding his motorcycle, 
And the headlight on the motorcycle failed, and he saw an object in a field nearby. And when the object disappeared, the headlight came back. And that's from 1909. We don't have a lot of uh, sighting reports like that that predate um, the the uh, uh, predate, I should say, predate World War II. There are a couple. Uh, Len Stringfield, for example, mm-hmm. uh, was an NCO in intelligence during the Second World War, and he was on an aircraft flying from Iwo Jima to Japan right after the war had ended, and a UFO, uh, three UFOs actually, approached the aircraft, and the engine began to sputter, and they were warned, well, we may have to ditch because we're losing our engine, and then the objects disappeared, and the engines started functioning properly. So we have those sorts of things. France in 1954 had a lot of sightings where the objects uh, called these sorts of problems. Uh, what uh, There was an ancillary uh, effect as well as they would often see the creatures from inside and the creatures would point something at them and they, the the people would be paralyzed until the object left and then they could move again. Uh, South America was also involved in that in 1954. Then we come to 1957 and we yeah. have these sightings in Level Land, Texas. Nothing quite as dramatic as some of the things in France, but still it's the interaction with the environment and the stalling of the car engines that becomes important because it's not just one yeah. guy – Telling it, it's multiple people in multiple locations, and then the event moves to White Sands Missile Range some two hours, three hours later. Cool. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I, I'm just I'm, 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 part of the, you know, I've done my own UFO investigations, and I've even have well, I, what's I saw it, and, oh, so, see, you got me all fluttered here, <laughs> <laughs> and not even the prettiest of women have been able to do that, but I, you know, yeah. I mean, you have testimony from a law enforcement officers. You know, one of the people that you're supposed to be able to trust as a credible witness if something unusual were like to happen, or someone like yourself. I've saw in the uh, notes from about you that we got sent by Philip. You were former Air Force, but thank you for your service, by the way. Mm-hmm. And ah. I was about to knock my camera over. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. While you're adjusting your camera, I'm also f- former Army. I was a helicopter pilot uh, for, really? the, for the Army oh, for a long mm-hmm. time, an aircraft commander, and then I was in the Air Force as an intelligence officer, and then I went back into the Army as an intelligence officer. And I have a tour in Vietnam and a tour in Iraq. So it's, it, it makes you wonder. This, this is an interesting thing. You're saying about all the cars having engines, particular having problems round about these UFOs. It makes you wonder what's powering these UFOs. If it's something that's maybe affecting the electronics that's draining them. Well, I think that some of them. I think it, it, it relates to the propulsion system of some of them. They're creating some kind of an electromagnetic field. Not all of them do this. The Japanese during the Second World War were trying to create a weapon that used magnetism to stall engines, and they were able yeah. to do it, but its effective range was like 10 feet. And these things are much further away when they when they oh, do yeah. that sort of thing. Uh-huh. The, the other thing, the Condon Committee, which was the University of Colorado study in the late 1960s, the Air Force financed them to study UFOs, mm-hmm. and they were supposed to find three things. Uh, does it affect national security? Um, well, did the Air Force do a good investigation, and is there any scientific value to continue the study? And that, this is all laid out prior to the investigation beginning, and that's exactly what they found. And I, I, I bring this up only because the Condon Committee didn't look at the level land sightings because they could think of no mechanism that you where an uh, electromagnetic field would stall an engine, and then when you remove mm-hmm. that electromagnetic field, the engine would start spontaneously. But that's sort of a misnomer in these cases because when you read the stuff carefully, you find out very few people talk about the engine starting spontaneously. It's all they took an action. They started the engine. The car operated properly. They don't say it started spontaneously. One guy in Level Land insisted that his engine started spontaneously. Everybody else was talking about how they had to start the engine. But the Condit Committee rejected the idea simply because they could think of no me- mechanism that would allow that to happen. Yeah. So they operated on a misnomer. They also said, well, it's too late. We couldn't find the cars and this sort of thing. I'm thinking in 1967, 1968, you could find the people. You could have talked to the sheriff. You could have learned something more had you bothered to to do that. But they didn't yeah. bother with it. They just wrote it off and dismissed it completely and went on from other things. Now, here I am in 2022 
just yeah. published a book on Level Land, and I went back and I found all kinds of information uh, through newspaper clippings, through the Air Force files, through other case files from the Air Force, through the NICAP files, through the APRO files. I found all kinds of things. And we see that the phenomena of this this electromagnetic effect expands beyond 1957. And I have some cases from the late um, uh, uh, 2019, 2018, and we find that animals sometimes react to these fields, and we yeah. know that uh, that's kind of a related phenomena. Uh, Fran Ridge, who I mentioned earlier, has got something he calls MADAR, which is a bunch of nodes around the country, and it's set up specifically to detect UFOs, and part of it is, is looking for the magnetic signature, but there's other yeah. sensors on this, and if they get a, an alert on one of the sensors, then they check around to see if other people have had a UFO sighting nearby to, to kind of correlate the, the two and have had some success, not a lot of success, but they don't have as many nodes as I'm sure he would like to have out there operating. But the point simply is we're gathering the data and we're di- gathering it scientifically now, as opposed to just waiting for something to happen. Uh, you know, Fran Ridge is more proactive in that. Let's see if we can yeah. make, uh, we, can, we can discover something. Part of the book relates to people using um UFO detectors to to see the UFOs, and there's a number of instances yeah. that reported in the APRO bulletin of that happening as well. So we've got some kind of a phenomenon that is um, fairly it's, rare, but it is affecting the electronic signals of uh, uh, all kinds yeah, of things. They, they, yeah, they've knocked mean, radio stations off the air. They've they've knocked power out of uh, on, on some cities. Uh, there's all kinds of these sort of things that are related to the electromagnetic effects. I mean, it, it's, it fascinates me. I mean, I like cars and I like engines and things to do with cars. And it fascinates me to the fact that it can take the power of the car away, right? And then the car just spontaneously starts again. And for, for something to do that, you have to turn the key. You have to get that starter motor to turn that engine over. And, it, and it's, it's, it's amazing. In in most of the cases I looked I looked through and I, I mentioned this to uh, Mark Rodiger and a couple of other people going through this thing I was looking for specifically what happened after the UFO left did they have to start the car themselves did they have to yeah. turn the key or push the button as we do now um, yeah. and in most of the cases they did they took some action to start the car yeah the lights came back on because the the uh, electro flow that had been the, the electron flow that had been uh, disturbed by the magnetic field now removed, allowed the electrons to flow, and the lights came back on, but that doesn't get the engine to start. So they had to take some action. Very few people say it started spontaneously, although there are some cases where they insist yeah. that the car started spontaneously. It's fascinating. Dakota, would you like to? No, I was just going to think that this – I mean, I've only had one instance where I was out and about and had what looked like a craft start messing with the electronics in my car, almost caused me to crash. Thank God nobody else was on the road <laughs> because it, I was just on my way to work. I wasn't even trying to go into anything special, but it, I was getting all excited here because it cooperates a lot of the things I've dealt with, and I've had sightings yeah. within a mile from my house and almost gotten speeding tickets because I – didn't realize there was a cop underneath the craft. Then I have contacts in local law enforcement and say, oh, did they see something? Did they see something? They're like, no, but they wish they had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, is, it, is, it is fascinating if you think about it because I've seen, I seen a UFO once and I thought, right, I need to take a video of this UFO and I, and I started focusing on it and my phone just kept packing in. It just kept packing in. It, it's as if the the full HD camera just would not, it just would not work. But when this thing went away, it was fine. And that's what I can't fathom, how this is possible. One of the things that I kind of blundered into on this, and um, I'm working on gathering more data, is cell phone failures. Because a lot of people said, well, I tried to take a photograph with my cell phone and it didn't work. Or we tried to take a video with the cell phone and all we got was the audio. We didn't get any um, any any photographic evidence. We just got the audio from the cell phone. And one guy talked about how his cell phone cracked uh, when he tried to use it to, to uh, record something like that. The other interesting thing, and I only found four cases of this, is the, um, cha- the, the, the close approach of the UFO changed the colors of the car. 
Uh, and one guy, I, and I can't remember whether the car was green and it turned gray or it was gray and turned green, but uh, the guy who got home after the sighting and his wife said, did you buy a new car? Because the paint had changed. The paint had changed color. And there's there's only four cases I found, not and, and not all four of them did the paint, uh, the whole car change color, but there was some change of paint around that. Um, we also got cases where the um, one guy was talking about, and this was in the content committee report, as a matter of fact, I believe it's, it's, it's the one where the, the UFO approached and stalled the car, but it erased the cassette tapes that he had in the car as well, or caused them to malfunction in that's, some fashion, which is another indication it's an electromagnetic effect. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You use tapes, you use a strong magnetic field. That's, so there's a lot of data there that has been collected over the years, haphazardly, I guess is the best way to say it. And, you know, we're trying to consolidate the information and put it all together. Avi Loeb, who was the Harvard astronomer that uh, is now attempting to set up a project to to gather this information. I've talked to him a couple of times and, and mentioned this to him, and he seems to be somewhat uninterested in it. Uh, <laughs> although I think it impacts indirectly what he wants to do. He's looking outward toward the objects coming into the solar system, like the thing that moved through a couple of years ago that kind of sparked his interest. Is that that? I can't, mm. I can't even pronounce it. Was it a moo moo Yes. Yeah, it was that. He believed it was artificial, and, and of course yeah. other scientists say, well, you know, that's just ridiculous. Why would they be sending out these probes? And I'm thinking to myself, didn't we send one out in 1976 that just left the solar system? And they're yeah. talking about it uh, reaching another solar system in 80,000 years. So, uh, you know, another civilization may have been doing the same thing, looking at their uh, – or, or any number of civilizations looking at their own uh, solar systems and sending out these probes past their planets before they develop the capability to travel to them themselves. And that happened to be one of the things that left their solar system, and it came through ours yeah. um, I mean, at a, a sub-light speed which means it was traveling for probably hundreds of thousands of years. But, I mean, we have a lot of stuff going on now that is suggestive of other, other civilizations. And science is beginning to look at it seriously. Mm -hmm. And had we done this from the beginning, I think what happened in 1947, uh, our Air Force was caught by surprise by what fell at Roswell. Yes. And that set up, the idea we've got to keep this under wraps because if we can figure out how this thing worked, we moved far beyond our competitors in the world at that time. And so it made sense to keep it secret for that. And of course, it, World War II had only ended two years earlier, and yes. it seemed to make sense to keep people from panicking about what this might have been. Uh, but the, but that all persists until today. And we've, we've, we've witnessed repeated so-called scientific investigations of the phenomena. It always says, oh, there's nothing there. We don't need to worry about it. But it always comes back. There's always more stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, no matter how much mud they throw at the at the topic, it, it yeah. seems to come back. And you've got an awful lot of credible witnesses and, and uh, other uh, avenues or other chains of, of evidence that can be explored. But we just haven't ever sat yeah. down to look at it from that point of view. And that was one of the things I did with the Leveland book was look at it mm -hmm. from the point of view here. What are the chains of evidence that go through this whole phenomenon here in Leveland and the sightings that took place in the United States in, in early November of 1957? Because not only it was not only in Leveland, there are other places where they, they experienced the car stalling and that sort of thing. Yes. Can I ask you something? Do you think there was any connection with the nuclear weapons getting tested by Roswell? I, yes, I do. I think that if I'm a spacefaring race and I discover yeah. somebody who's just discovered atomic power and has detonated yeah. a couple of atomic bombs, not to mention the first atomic bomb was detonated in New Mexico. That's right. And then I discover that they're practicing, practicing, experimenting with their rockets in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm going to look because these people have the po potential to be a threat to us because they're learning how to take the first steps into space and they're dealing with atomic power, which they may not understand completely. And I think in 1947, we certainly didn't understand the yeah. way we do today. But I think that makes sense for the activity in New Mexico because of those sorts of things. I don't think that they were drawn to us because of the explosions uh, in New Mexico and in Japan in 1945, because mm. 
even if they have the capability of detecting that from their home worlds, Mm -hmm. it would still be traveling at the speed of light. And the closest star system is four light years away, which means it would have taken four years for the signal to get there. And now we don't know how long it takes them to get to our home world, but that would have put them beyond 1947. I, that would imply that they were much closer and maybe watching yeah. us or, or something like that. But I think the fact that we had the atomic experimentation going on in New Mexico and the rocketry going on in New Mexico and that sort of thing, I think that yeah. that suggests a reason they they came to New Mexico in in that time frame, why they were in New Mexico. What, what puzzles me is, is why did the ship crash in Roswell? I have no why idea. Did, yeah. I always say, well, somebody pushed the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> somebody was somebody shouldn't have been driving that day. Yeah, well, they, 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 had a, they had a beer bust, and uh, <laughs> yeah. The other thing, the theory I, I absolutely love for this, and people have thought I was serious in it, is they crashed it on purpose. Which, yeah. what's the most non-threatening way to introduce yourself to another sentient race? You present sure, them with yes. the technology, oh. and 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 your mortality and see you're we're not that big a threat because we have the same problems you do and he said well did they kill their own people well maybe not maybe they just had some bodies laying around and put them in the craft and crashed it to, to announce their presence nice. and then we foiled them by uh covering the whole thing up but uh, uh this is not a theory i subscribe to i don't believe that's yeah. the reason i just think that you know if you say well why did they crash well here's a theory of why they crashed uh not a very good theory, I'm afraid, but a theory nonetheless. So I, I, I fall mean, back it, on the, they push the wrong button, and, and no matter how good your technology is, something's going to go wrong at some point. Oh yeah. And yes. and I remember, I, I'm sure we're all old enough to remember cars that uh, weren't, weren't as reliable as they are today, and uh, the troubles we had to it, or the beginnings of the internet, and and how that was. Very, very problematic or yeah. televisions or anything they think you know, as we watch the evolution of the technology, how they become much, much better and much more reliable than they were when they were first introduced. Well, you think you think you know, how technology and humankind has jumped from 1947 till today? I think it's just the innovation of the human race. If yeah. you look at if you look at 1947 as the, as the, as the stopgap, this is where it all began. But you can see the evolution of things prior to 1947 and and beyond. Um, take the evolution of the light bulb, yep. which um, people said, well, you know, a white man didn't invent the, uh, the electric light. And I'm thinking, well, that statement is accurate because it was a series of white men. And the first mm-hmm. one was um, Alexandro Volta. And I think 1802, 1804 hooked up a storage battery to wire and got it to glow. He's invented the yeah. incandescent light, in essence, Yes. with a glowing yeah. wire. Impractical though it may be, he's invented yeah. it. Uh, later on, a guy named Swan, an English guy, said mm-hmm. that um, he, he created, once the technology existed to create a, a, a much better vacuum, he created a, an electric incandescent bulb that would burn longer than that, but the filament he used was platinum. Not exactly yeah. the most... Uh, inexpensive way of doing it. Then yeah. you bring in Thomas Edison. That's he right. created the the element, uh, the the fiber carbon element that would burn for 1,200 hours or so. Now you've got a practical light bulb. Then you bring in a guy named Lattimore, and he's the first black man in this whole story. Uh-huh. And he created a, a filament that was more reliable than the one that Edison had. But before you get to Lattimore, you've got three white guys involved. But the real point is you've got an evolution of that technology. And yes. although Volta had an idea for an incandescent light, he had to wait for other technology to evolve. And that was the, the ability to create the vacuum, a reliable mm-hmm. vacuum in the light bulb so that the filament wouldn't burn out quickly. And then Edison uh, worked on it from there. So you can see the kind of evolution things took. And it took from from the early 19th century into the later 19th century before the electric light became a a practical invention. And I think if you look at a lot of inventions, the first television uh, was invented in 1927. I think the first broadcast of a baseball game was in 1939. Mm -hmm. But the technology then didn't develop rapidly after that because the Second World War got in the way. That's right. 
Uh, but but the, you see the evolution of the technology, and of course the broadcast of the baseball game. I think it was New York City, and there were like 500 people could have watched it. And and if you live in New York City, you might as well go to the ballpark. <laughs> it's, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of like uh, the Wright brothers. The belt they're playing out of sticks and canvas, right? And they kind of stayed at kind of like biplanes all the way up to the war started. Right, World War Two, and then you had Nazi Germany and you had America, and they were trying to outthink each other. And and look at look at the aircraft we have today. I mean, we've got jet fighters that are. Unbelievable. Well, you go back, you, you go back even further in into the 19th century. There was experiments with gliders and things like yep. that. I think the Wright brothers built on that and were able to find a yeah. gasoline powered engine that they created was light enough to to create the lift for the aircraft but that was 1903 so in 1903 we've got a biplane that flies what 120 feet and, mm-hmm. and stays aloft for 59 seconds and in 1969 we're putting men on the moon yeah so that was a really rapid um, evolution of technology going from that point to people on the moon yeah cool well and that's no, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> a little yeah. bit. Yeah, no. He's excited. No, this, He's excited. Yeah. Uh, yes, I am. And <laughs> you know, uh, it just goes to show that p- perhaps back in the day when a lot of the research started into this type of thing, to some extent, you could probably forget the individuals involved because they simply didn't know what to look for. And it's I've seen it are an argument nowadays where people try to say, oh, that can't happen because I can't think of anything that could cause that. Well, mm-hmm. someone smarter may have come along. But it, well, I've always I've always said, you know, we haven't really decoded what the wreckage does for us because we don't we don't have the technology to understand that. And I used to say that if you took a power pack, a TV and a VCR back to Merlin the Magician, and oh, I understand that now people don't understand what a VCR is. <laughs> but, but, but the point was, you take that material back to to Merlin Magician. You've got a black ribbon in essence, and if you know the secrets, you can get pictures and sound, color pictures and sound from it. But you've got to know, right. you've got to understand two things that are invisible: electric electricity and magnetism. And Merlin the Magician did not have the technology to understand that. And now you you show up with something like that, we say, oh yeah, we we get it, we understand how that works. And I think that the technology that was revealed to us in 1947 is of such a technologically leap leap forward that we haven't decoded a lot of it. I sometimes say that I think maybe the um, evolution of the composite materials that we use in aircraft now may have been something that was developed based on looking at the the material recovered in Roswell. But if you look at some of the other things, uh, you can see the evolution predates, begins prior to to Roswell and yes. is not necessarily predicated on what happened in Roswell. And I think that the uh, there's probably a core of people, a small core of people that watch our technology, meaning can we apply this technology, the materials recovered in Roswell and see what that where that takes us if it doesn't create a great leap forward in our understanding. But I don't yeah. think we've made that great, great leap forward yet. And I think we've, because we've kept it so secret that we can't apply the full capability of the human race to understanding mm-hmm. it. We're so afraid of our competitors in the world gathering Not that right. technology. Back during World War I, uh, we had created, and I say we, the United States Browning had created the Browning Automatic Rifle. That's right, yeah. And it it was such a leap forward in the technology of a machine gun Mm -hmm. that they didn't use them in World War II because they were afraid the Germans would capture them. And so we, even though we had that weapon, we didn't use it. Of course, in World War II, it was very, very prevalent. But, I mean, that's that's the kind of thing I think we look at is that the technology, we we worry about what other people were going to do with the technology as we develop it and how they can use it against us. And I think that kind of inhibits the scientific research that could be done. Had we uh, applied all our scientific knowledge to what fell at Roswell in 1947, we might be traveling among the stars by now, but we certainly aren't. Uh, What was it, 1972 was the last time we put men on the moon, and we're still talking Uh, about doing it. And and the United States is the only one that's done it. I, I think that there's other nations that have the capability of, to do it, 
Uh, yeah. But nobody else has done it to this point. I think the Chinese are working to do it. Um, yeah. I think I'm, I'm Elon, Musk, sure he's wants, Elon Musk wants to go back there. Elon Musk, he wants to go back there, but it's... And he's taken yeah. the first steps to yeah. do that, and and then, and then he, he gets the blowback from all the people. Well, he's wasting all this money on his pet projects. What good is it yeah. doing? I'm thinking, yeah, I think the pet project of putting people on the moon has really advanced our um, civilization because the computing mm-hmm. capability of the first moon, lunar lander isn't as great as my cell phone. Yeah. But the miniaturization and that technology is an outgrowth of what they were doing to to – uh, reduce the size of the computers and the weight of the computers so that they could put them on the spacecraft. So we, yeah, we benefit I, from that stuff. And, and, and instead people say, well, it cost us $400 million to go to the moon. And what, what is that $400 million doing us? It's sitting on the moon. And I'm thinking, no, it's in the pockets of the engineers and it's in the yeah. pockets of the manufacturers and it's in the pockets of the blue collar workers who built many of the components that went into yeah. the spacecraft. And it's, uh, the people who've done the research and there's all kinds that that yeah. $400 million went out through the economy and it's not sitting on the moon. They well, are I, sitting on the moon, but the, but the, but the money is still in the economy here and people don't understand that. Yeah. I, I agree 100% because there was a lot of technology developed for the men yes. to go to the moon that gets used today. Mm-hmm. And I, and, I think we're needing to, we're needing to start doing that again. We're needing to start going back to the moon and then Mars and think of the technology that will be produced from these sub from these things. You know. Well, we can take it a step further. You know, for the longest time, we had really no idea what Pluto looked like. That's right. I've yeah. always thought of Pluto as a Mickey Mouse little planet, but <laughs> that's just my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we had no idea what it looked like because the technology didn't exist, and now we have photographs and information of Pluto that gives us a, a real picture of that world that um, we, we just didn't have until uh, what four, four or five years ago. Yeah. And the technology has developed that we can do that sort of thing. We drop probes into Jupiter to understand more about it. Yeah. Um, and I think they just, didn't they just talk about somebody had gotten pictures of the surface of Venus and uh, new pictures using a new I technology, see. getting the surf pictures of the I surface of Venus. It turns know. out it's not a big water world with lots of humidity, no. yeah. <laughs> but a place that if you landed on it, it'd melt your spacecraft. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Dakota, would you like to ask? Uh, there's so many ways to go about this, man. And it seems like every time we get into the more interesting side of things, my signal conveniently starts bugging out. <laughs> I know. I know. That's like the usual. The usual, you know. Uh can I ask you something? Have you ever seen a real-life UFO? I used to say no to that question because my UFO sighting is so crappy. It's just really doesn't need to be mentioned. Oh, don't tell. Please tell. When, oh, I, was, oh. when I was a teenager, I lived in Denver, Colorado. And Denver, Colorado has the Denver UFO Society. And it was uh, in, in operation in the... Uh, mid 1960s and I was yeah. in high school at the time but a friend of mine and I would attend the meetings and we had a big meeting near Castle Rock Colorado and we we're sitting around the campfire at night and look up and we see something crossing the sky going from north to south gets directly overhead it flashes once and it continues on that's it that's my sighting now we checked and there was nothing in a polar orbit it was going from uh, Actually, south to north, north to south. It was in a polar orbit. There was nothing in a polar orbit that we have been able to see at that time. And this is the uh, probably 1965, 1966 time frame. So there wasn't a lot of satellites up there at the, at the same time. That's yeah. that's it. That's all I've ever seen. It's not a close approach. It was miles and miles above us, uh, probably yeah. maybe, maybe not even in the atmosphere, but it was, uh, that was it. But I, but it, was, it, was your, it was your moment. It was your You'll, you'll remember well, we that. Watched you know? it. We watched it cross the sky. I mean, it was in, it was clearly not autokinesis from the eyeballs looking at a bright star or anything like that. It, <laughs> crossed the, it, crossed the, it crossed the sky in a straight line, and it yeah. got overhead once, and it flashed, and it continued on, and, and that was it. But uh, my friend and I, we looked. We tried to, we tried to get the um, satellite trackings and things like that to see if there was something in a polar orbit that would account for the sighting, and, and we just could never find anything. So we just yeah. – that was it. It was obviously not an aircraft, and uh, we'll let it go. Just a bright light. 
Out, out of your honest opinion, who or where do you think these entities are from? That are I don't really right have now? a good idea. Um, I, I think, I, I wonder if they're all from the same place or if there's multiple places. And I say that yeah. because if you if you take an aircraft carrier and you fly your aircraft off it, you're going to get different descriptions of the aircraft from the people who see it, from, from helicopters to jets to propeller-driven aircraft. Mm-hmm. And so if you're traveling through interstellar distances, you may have some kind of a craft with lots of shuttles or whatever on it. And so what yeah. we may be seeing in the atmosphere is something smaller as opposed to the interstellar craft. Yeah. <clears throat> but that really doesn't tell us much of anything. I am hesitant to embrace Zeta-1, Zeta-2 reticuli, which is the Barney and Betty Hill case, because yeah. I think that the star map that Betty Hill drew and then Marjorie Fish tried to find the location and, and determined it was Zeta-1, Zeta-2 reticuli is outdated mm-hmm. because better information has moved some of the stars into either further away or closer in than they were in when Marjorie Fish was doing her work. She eliminated all red dwarfs saying, well, there'd be nothing around a red dwarf that that a spacefaring race would be interested in. And I'm thinking, how do you know that? Yeah. Uh, There may be some mineral in the planets around the red dwarfs that would be of value to Mm -hmm. them. The idea of a a sentient race developing on a planet around a red dwarf is probably limited given the uh, limited um, Goldilocks zone around the planet and the way the evolution of those kinds of stars, but still there may be mineral minerals or other elements that are of interest to them that they would want to yes. to gather. So yes. I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I suspect based on nothing whatsoever that the people, the aliens visiting would be from star systems closer to us than further away, yes. but I don't know that. And, and an analogy is sort of, you know, if you live in a small city, you may have to go to a hub to catch an aircraft to go a much yes. further distance. Mm-hmm. But, but you know, the, the point simply is you, you may have the capability to travel the interstellar distances if you know that, and then you launch your, your craft into the, the local area. So I, I just really don't understand yeah. enough about it. And if I did, I would be really, really rich. <laughs> and I wouldn't be talking to you guys. That's very, that's very true. I mean, if if you really think about it, these I'd, be buying, is... I'd be buying one of them five hundred million dollar yachts in uh, Holland, oh, nice. telling him to d- d- dismantle your bridge so I can get it out to the ocean. That would be, that would be lovely. Oh, you don't course. know. Maybe 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 five hundred million people will buy your book. You, you never know. <laughs> you know. I mean, you must think about it in this sense. I mean, these entities, these aliens, the the bounty be highly sophisticated even to travel out of their solar system to ours the yes. mu- there must be thousands of years more advanced even millions of years more it makes you wonder why they're so interested in us because we are basically ants to them if you really think about it well but we have scientists who study ants so there yeah. you go there was a mar- marvelous movie that came out um from the united kingdom a number of years ago called morons in outer space And the idea Ah. was they had the spacecraft, but they didn't know how to build them. All they could do was fly it around, and I think they crashed it on Earth. They did the crash. But I I think there may be some of that. You've got the the brilliant people, the brilliant creatures, the brilliant aliens who create the technology, and then the pilots flying it, well, they may understand more about it than – other members of the crew. I'm you know, thinking my own experience as a pilot. Yeah, I understood more about the operation of a helicopter than maybe the, the yeah. door gunner sitting behind me did. But I mean, um, you would assume a level of technology and a, yeah. a, 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 a level of sophistication, but we don't know that. We don't know anything about, we have nothing to judge it on. All yeah. we can say is based on earth, every time a technologically superior civilization contacts a more primitive civilization, that primitive mm-hmm. c- civilization ceases to exist. Yes. Not necessarily through conquest, the mere introduction of the technology changes yeah. the society and yeah. elevates them to a new, another level. Uh, after the, at, prior to the Battle of the Little Bighorn, where George Custer met his fate, Sitting Bull yeah. had warned 
the Lakota, don't take anything. Leave it on the field. And, yeah. and his thinking was they can't reproduce it. They need the European, the American technology yeah. to create the, the, uh, the ammunition for the weapons. And if the That's weapon right. breaks, they don't have the technology to fix it. Yeah. And so he was afraid of that sort of influence on um, the Lakota. Well, the Lakota, the Cheyenne and um, and and the other tribes that uh, helped them at the Little Bighorn. Yeah. But but the point simply is, I think Sitting Bull understood the danger of contacting a technologically advanced civilization and that you end up with this technology you cannot reproduce here. Now you are beholden to that technology and you alter the civilization. There was an anthropological study done a number of years ago where the um, primitive peoples had a ritual for borrowing a stone axe from the elders. Yeah of the tribe and to, to, they would have to go through this ritual to borrow the, the stone ax. He showed up and to induce the people to talk to him, he gave them steel axes. Well, steel mm -hmm. axes is far superior to a stone ax. Well, yeah. He undercut one of the, one of the societal pr prerequisites for getting an ax by doing that and changed the society, not meaning to do it, merely wanting to induce yeah. them to talk to him. But he had, he had kicked out one of the underpinnings of the society merely by the introduction of the steel axe. And so I think that may be part of the problem that we face yeah. here is we I do mean, not understand the technology. And I think, I think yeah. some of the governments and why, why some of this remains secret is the governments are fearing the introduction of that technology. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, like, it's like the tribes in the Amazon jungle, if you think about it. They've been used to hunting with their spears and over the hundreds of years, and then the white man's came along and gave them chainsaws and gave them technology, and they don't know how to go back because they've lost it, if you know what I'm trying to say. Well, I think I think there's something to be said for that. And as I said, you know, it's not necessarily conquest that does it. It's the mere introduction of the technology. Yes. And and the other ways and the other knowledge uh, of of what's uh, in the world around you. I mean, if you if you're isolated in the Amazon forest, mm -hmm. you don't realize that there's airplanes. There was uh, the cargo cults from World War Two. These were tribes on the various Pacific islands and they would see yeah. the the soldiers show up or the Marines show up and they would mm -hmm. create these big swaths of long airstrips and airplanes would come and provide them with all kinds of supplies and, and <laughs> the, the tribes were thinking, well, this is something the gods are sending to me. So if we create a runway and put these artificial airplanes around yeah. them, we'll get some of that stuff as, as true. They didn't understand the connection between the, yeah. didn't understand the technology that brought that stuff to, to the yeah. Island. So I think, I think that all comes into play. It's, 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 it's fascinating. And it makes you, it makes you wonder where us humans will be in the next hundred years. It, 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 where do you think we'll be if we don't blow ourselves up? Obviously, I don't think we're going to blow ourselves up, <laughs> even though, even though I think uh, some of the governments think that that Putin's about to do that. Oh yeah. But yeah. I think I, I, I don't see how we would envision the technology. If we're in the 1950s, look at a, look at the science fiction movies from the 1950s and 1960s, and the technology they've envisioned from there, from that point. Yeah. Uh, and and the thing you think of the the the, the video phones that they envisioned, they yeah. didn't envision that we were carrying the video phone around in our pocket. They didn't envision oh, yeah. that, that you and I would be having this discussion over the airwaves, being able to see one another yeah. uh, in this fashion. They didn't envision this stuff. I think it's impossible to envision. And, and you know, I think that you go back to your grandparents or my grandparents yeah. at least, you know, they they were born into a world where there weren't cars and there weren't airplanes and there wasn't television. Yeah. There wasn't rockets. And when you look at what they've seen in their lifetimes and yes. then you think about what you've seen in yours. We went from black and white televisions with a picture tube that was 21 inches, which was really, <laughs> really big, to to these <laughs> massive things we have today with a color that is incredible. And the signal is so sharp and clear, except, of course, for Dakota. Yeah, yeah, I think he's on one <laughs> megapixel camera, you know. Yeah, but and 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 we and, and and I carry around in my pocket, as do you, the entire yep. knowledge of the human race. Yep. 
All I have to do is figure out the question to ask Google and I can get the information from the entire knowledge of the human race. And I, nobody's envisioned that. So where are we going to be in 100 years? It's going to be incredible. It's, it's frightening because if you think about talking about aircraft, you look at the aircraft that is today. I mean, I'm fascinated with aircraft today, especially the new uh, American fighter jets that are out. I mean, and the new helicopters, the new attack gunship helicopters. I mean, that... Can you imagine what the aircraft of the military will look like in a hundred years? I suspect they're going to be triangular shaped. Yes. Because we're having lots of sightings of triangular shaped craft now, and we didn't have that many before. And I, and I, I wonder if that isn't some kind of a terrestrial uh, development uh, as opposed to something extraterrestrial. But that's kind of an interesting thought. Well, it, it makes you wonder, there's probably two guys with two lab coats on right now standing looking at the Roswell crash in a hangar saying, how does this work? <laughs> 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 well, if you remember the movie Independence Day, they couldn't get it to work until the uh, aliens showed until up showed again up. and, and yeah. then, then the craft came on. I said, oh, that's how it works. Should have <laughs> flipped this switch. <laughs> yeah. So before we wrap up, Dakota, would you like to do anything before we wrap up? Actually, I do have one last question to kind of take this into a different direction because I would like to get your thoughts on this. Nowadays, you have a lot of guides where people are taking more spiritual routes to allegedly call on these ETs, and you actually have sometimes are lucky enough to get footage that shows that something actually shows up. What are your thoughts on that? I don't think it really works any more than the cargo cults worked. You know, um, I, I a lot of the stuff when when they see the stuff, it's through um, night vision goggles or it's uh, mm -hmm. cell phone cameras that appended to night vision goggles that get stuff. And I think it's a, a, a an artifact of marrying those two electronic devices together, or just the sing, just looking through the um, the night vision goggles that you see the strange things that you don't normally pick up with the unaided eye. I don't think there's a religious component to it. I think if they do see something, it's more coincidental than it is uh, a causation. So I, I don't think there really is a religious, I think I, I take a much more, I guess, uh, non-secular look at this type of yeah. uh, activity. Oh, no, I was a secular oh. look. I'm sorry. Secular oh. look. Curious, I was what your thoughts would be because it seems to be growing more and more popularity these last few days, and maybe you think it's going to be something that offsets the Russian Ukraine situation right now. Because I think they said that allegedly there's intelligence that says on the 16th Putin's going to start making his move. So I don't know. Yeah. I hope he doesn't. I'm a little bit leery about some of the intelligence coming out of the uh, United States because I've watched the yeah. State Department guy and he wouldn't answer the question, well, where do you get this intelligence? Well, we just know it. It's going to happen. Pay attention to us. And I think it may be an overreaction. I can't – personally, I can't – probably shouldn't comment on it, but I just I, – I see no benefit to Putin to – to do anything like that. I know one guy said, well, what do, why do you amass 100,000 troops on the border? Well, there's always military exercises going That's on. Right. We're massing the Sixth Fleet in various places for exercises. I, yeah. I think Putin is just kind of testing the waters. I think uh, I don't. I cannot see any benefit for them jumping. Yeah. But that's just my uninformed opinion. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's been a brilliant show tonight, and I would like to thank you for coming on, Kevin. And well, guys, at, at least we got to talk about Level Land a little bit. <laughs> we did. We did. We'll need, we'll need to have you back sometime. But the, uh, Dakota will put the links in for your book, which I'm going to purchase, by the way, because I, I'm, go, I, I'm going to look forward to this. And there's the book, guys, if you want to purchase that. It's so, is it on Amazon? Is it on Amazon? Am I it's on that? Amazon, of course. Uh, I've got a blog, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and if you go there, there's a link to the book as well there and some of my other UFO books including, including, including Roswell in the 21st Century and some of my uh, science fiction that you can get to. So. Yeah, well. well yeah, link, to your web, link to Kevin's website are actually in the description of this episode for those of you listening to the podcast version. Mm -hmm. You should be able to find it there. I, I would like to thank you again. This has definitely been a very informative right. show. 
that has been. <laughs> it's been absolutely amazing. I didn't expect this on the, tonight, and it's been absolutely fantastic. But anyway, guys, I would like to thank you for all coming. And Dakota, would you like to play the trailer before we all right. depart? Start playing us out. Come on. There we go.